Ready, uh, go for launch. Five. Quiet, numbskulls, I'm broadcasting. Anything can happen in the next half hour. Four. My friend, we cannot keep this a secret any longer. This whole thing is insane. Three. Quiet, please. I am analyzing. Where's the kaboom? Two. There was supposed to be an earth-shattering kaboom. One. Greetings, my fellow galactic travelers, and welcome back to Planet 8. This is your mission commander, Larry, speaking to you from our hidden base. Chief Engineer Bob is here by my side as always in the command center, and circling Planet 8 in our orbital spy satellite is Reconnaissance Officer Karen. And we are back. We're going to have a fun episode today. This is going to be kind of a uh, getting to know part of your Planet 8 crew uh, our reconnaissance officer is going to interrogate, uh, ask us some fun questions related to the genre. And, uh, you know, we were communicating back and forth over the past week, a couple of days, and and Karen would not uh, give us a hint or a clue as at what today's uh, oh. questions will be. So this is going to be fun and interesting. Uh, straight away, we'll kick it over to Walker up in the satellite. Take it away, my friend. All right. So, yes, this is the official Planet 8 questionnaire, not to be confused with the Colbert questionnaire, <laughs> the actor studio, or many other questionnaires. But by the time we're done, our audience will know Bob and Larry very, very well. I Intimately. Believe. Intimate. Well, let's not go there. Let's well, save that for Planet 8 After Dark. <laughs> And so I will begin with the first question. This will go to our mission commander, Larry. Who is your favorite universal monster? Oh. Um, Don't overthink it. Frankenstein. Frankenstein. The monster or the doctor? Oh, uh, sorry. The, the monster. Frankenstein. The monster. The monster. And Bob, I think this is an easy one for you. Of course, it's Creature from the Black Lagoon. There we go. See, it starts you guys off with a softball here. There we go. Well, how about, well, who would be your runner-up, Larry? The Creature. <laughs> Mine might be Wolfman. Yeah, I, you know, it, it, it's hard. It depends on, you know, I guess what film I've seen most recently. And, and uh, you know, you love them all, right? All right, gentlemen. Bob, number two, aliens or robots? Hmm. That's a good one. Cause that is. There are some damn cool robots, and there's also some damn cool aliens. Don't overthink it. What's uh, your gut tell you? I'm going to go robots. All right. Larry, same question. Aliens or robots? Tough question. First voice I heard in my mind was beady beady buck. Uh, so I'm gonna go with robots. Robots. All right. There's more danger, danger will well. All right. Number three. Start with Larry this time. What is your favorite monster sound? A sound a monster makes that you just love? Mm -hmm. Frankenstein's fart. No, just kidding. <laughs> um you know, um, actually, I'm going to say Frankenstein. I, I like his growls. Before he could talk, he would have to emote and express, you know, ah. so I'll go with Frankenstein. Nice, yeah. nice imitation there. All right, Bob, same question. Monster sound. You know my answer. I think I know. Roar of Godzilla. <laughs> In fact, go. my, my truck has a Godzilla horn. That it I does. like roars like Godzilla. Excuse me. Bless so, you. Right. Um, but for How whatever I... reason, the, the horn gave out recently. Oh, I no. Just ordered a new one, which I think is actually louder than the old one. But hmm. yeah, I can kick off and hit Godzilla's roar whenever needed. 
Now, do you have a regular horn and a Godzilla horn, or just yeah. your horn is a Godzilla horn? I've got the regular horn in case some idiot gets in my way. <laughs> and then I've got the Godzilla horn in case I need attention. As well. <laughs> Very good. I want to get a horn that says "Bidi Bidi Buck." <laughs> well, so I wanted to get Debbie. You know, Debbie needs well, to her car, and I wanted to get like the. Uh, I wanted to get like the uh, ship, from, you know, like the Star Wars sound. The... <laughs> that would be cool. Okay, number four here. Let's start with Bob. What yeah. is the one? piece the one item in your collection that you treasure above all others well i think i've talked about it before but um and it would take me a while to go over and grab it but um yeah i have a 1954 godzilla about that's pretty tall and uh maybe while Larry's answering his part of it. I'll go get it. But uh, it was painted silver screen style by Kevin D'Antonio. Mm. Uh, Very nice. And it was also, we used it for a display in our first Godzilla Fest back in uh, 2004. So, yes, I was. I would say either that or the Ultraman guitar. Oh, yeah. um, Very cool. Um these are great questions walker and very tough because as i look around you know i'm setting up the mobile command um yes i know you you obviously lost some things yeah but i i i found things you know in the old mobile command i would rotate you know i'd, I'd get new stuff and then put old stock on the shelf and new stock and and bob's the one that taught me to layer my father-in-law always <laughs> comments about just how much she pushing stuff together. <laughs> there it is. Oh, and if you you are on YouTube, obviously you can YouTube. see Godzilla. If you're not on YouTube, jump on. You can see this pretty magnificent. It looks like Bob's just got his his reptilian son on his knee. <laughs> it's just that big. <laughs> Godzilla, tell me what he wants for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> um. So uh, th th there's a lot of great stuff, but I'm I'm going to go with the Jeff Winkel Gunther uh, wow. mask. He 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 commissioned uh, ten of them, and and someone changed their mind at the last minute. I, and I had no idea he was doing this. I was visiting, and I'm like, oh my god, it's Gunther. And he's like, yeah, this guy didn't, you know. And I'm like, I'll, I'll take it. And so I, I got the friends and family rate but uh that freaking thing the detail I, I think i've showed it before mm -hmm. the eyes and the teeth and and just, just phenomenal yeah so, jeff did an amazing I would, job. I would say there is one other piece that i have it's not in the monster garage it's down in the creature corner downstairs but uh it's the a bust full-size bust of the creature from black lagoon and also painted by kevin d'antonio mm. but the base being black, I have in silver paint. Uh, Julie Adams signed it. Ben Chapman signed it. And right in the middle, Rico Browning signed it. Wow. Yeah. Won't be able to get that. Yeah. There's a fire. Things. I got to run out here and grab Godzilla. And then I got to run down there and grab the. <laughs> and then maybe, you know, Debbie and Turtles. Well, they've got legs. They can Teddy. get. Oh, they can they can take care of themselves. Okay, I'll have a list of stuff I want them to grab. I'll so. I'll, have, I'll, I'll share my bonus. This is something that was found. Yeah. Bob Wilkins autograph. Yeah, so he's got a picture of Bob Wilkins that's autographed. Yes, for those of you on uh, YouTube, two Larry best wishes on your creature feature gold. Don't give up, Bob Wilkins. At one point in time, I tried to get creature features back on KTVU, <laughs> and I was corresponding with. Uh, whoever the producer of the facility this is before Fox bought them out. And uh, then Fox bought them out and they're like, well, you know, sorry, we're not going to do it. But anywho, on with the next question. On to the next question. Okay. We'll start with Larry. What was your most surprising celebrity experience? 
Ooh, and you know, I don't have the picture. I just recently found it. I've I've talked about this on my Facebook page, and it is on on the Facebook page. Marina Sirtis um, was at a Greg Giafria Rock and Jock Golf Tournament down in Monterey, and this was back in like the nineties, um, maybe even late eighties, because um, Robert. Wool Whirl was there. He was in the 1989 Batman, and he oh, played Robert like a, a detective or a right. reporter. Anyway, he was a real jerk. But there was Marina <laughs> in a golf cart with her then fiance, would later become her husband. Mm. And uh, you know, I went up to her, and my sister was with me, and my cousin Pete, and uh, I was just flustered. I couldn't really like talk, and she's like, you know, he's a huge Star Trek fan, and. And, you know, um, just wanted to come say hi. No, I, I am. I, you know, it's an honor to meet you, you know, fellow Greek. And she's like, oh, I, you know, with her British accent, Cockney accent, whatnot. And uh, reaches in her, her purse and pulls out a, a still black and white photo that you give out to producers or um, um, casting. Casting. Directors. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. And, you know best regards uh you know larry uh marina sirtis love marina or something like that and and it's not even in like a felt pen or anything like a sharpie all she had was like a ballpoint pen and uh, you know star trek the next generation had just come out so it wasn't like that i think they were like in their second season and um anyway that is one of my surprise encounters and and just so happy and elated that i i have a souvenir from that moment uh, there's a close second but bob take it away surprise see most of the celebrities i met we either bring them in for our shows or you know i well, don't see them. It, it could be that you found the experience surprising maybe the engagement mm. surprising. well uh, i'll talk about two as quickly as i can one i was working at a hyatt hotel in oakland that was connected to a convention center there and uh, i was like the av dude in the hotel so i was like going down the, i got in the elevator and this really tall woman got on just reeking of perfume ton of makeup i thought well she must be like a catering person or something or you know sales or whatever so you know we got down and we both left the i didn't think much about it and then i went over to the convention floor where they were having a convention at the time and their signing autographs were adam west burt ward Yvonne Craig and Julie Newmar. It was Julie <laughs> Newmar that I was in the elevator with. Mm. Would have like said something if I realized who it was, but so that was kind of a surprise. It is. Uh, the other surprising one would be at our first Godzilla Fest, we were able to get a 35 millimeter collector's print of War of the Gargantuas. And somehow I got a hold of Russ Tamlin. And invited him to the show. Mm. I said, hey, we're going to show this, you know, nice 35 millimeter print of War of the Gargantuas. You know, can you come up and be a guest? And he agreed. Uh, up until that point, everybody would talk about how he would never talk about the movie or people would ask him about it in interviews and he would just shove it aside and not want to discuss it. So we had him in the show and he sat through the movie with everybody, of course, in the theater applauding and cheering and, you know, rooting for their favorite gargantua and all that. And when it was over, we were going to go up to stage for an interview. He goes, you know, I don't know if I've ever seen the movie. He goes, I, I went over there and made it, but I don't think I ever saw it. It's kind of fun. <laughs> so he got up there and just went on for like half an hour about the movie. So now in subsequent interviews, I read a, and stuff he talks about stories and making the film and talks about the movie and yeah you know. so i think we kind of 
put him on the path to righteousness. <laughs> that is cool. By showing a movie in a theater full of crazy fans. That is the best. Yeah. Good um, stories there. I, I had a real quick second one. It was, and Walker, you were with me at Monster Palooza. Mm -hmm. Nakajima san is uh, in line to get breakfast. And uh, he was telling the cook, Godzilla. What is it? <laughs> Godzilla. And the guy's like, oh, well, I got Godzilla. How would you like your eggs? Over easy. <laughs> <laughs> Such a charming man. Bob knows more. I I'm sure has had more interaction with him than we have. But I was, yeah, yeah I was probably the same Monster Palooza. And I was, I didn't get it. At the time, I wasn't getting really good Wi-Fi in the hotel room. So I went down to the uh, bar area and uh, I was sitting at a table with my uh, Surface Pro and checking emails and whatever. And uh, Shinichi Wakasa, who was the suit builder for a lot of the Godzilla films, he we've known each other anyway. So he came over and sat down. We're talking. Hey. And suddenly he's like, oh, hey. And he's like gesturing over. And Nakajima comes over and he sits down at the table. So here I'm having a pseudo breakfast with Wakasa and Nakajima. And it's just like, God, if I was a kid and you told me this, I wouldn't believe you. <laughs> That's cool. 12 year old you would have lost his mind. So this one you may have to put on your thinking caps a little bit. I have no cap. Wait. We're going we're gonna to start with you. Uh oh, he's got to get he's got to get his official cap. They're both looking for their caps. Okay. I don't know what I did with mine. It wasn't it it wasn't you know literal. Okay, they've got their caps on. Very good, nice job. Oh, Larry's is better than mine. <laughs> All right, here's the question: Which science fiction, fantasy, or horror film got too many sequels, and which got too few? Okay. Who's going first? <laughs> Bob's going first this time. Okay. So which which genre film got too many sequels and which genre film got too few? Well, don't hate me for this, but I'm going to say Star Wars got too many. Ooh, I can understand that. That. Could, that could be a controversial opinion, but that's your opinion. That's cool. That's what you think. <laughs> too few? Um... And I've championed this on the podcast before. I'd say the live action 2008 Speed Racer, mm -hmm. which I thought was actually a good film. And it would have been nice to see some sequels, but didn't do that well in the theaters. As John Carter, too. John Carter, they wanted to make a series of movies on and they never got past the first one. So, yeah. I'd say Speed Racer or John Carter and too many. Uh, I'd say Star Wars. All right, it's over in your court now, Larry. Oh, he's he's doing calculations. I did. I was like writing down. I'm like uh, <laughs> I'm a visual person, so I had the to, um, too many. I think the Matrix. Oh, I'm right there with you, brother. You know, God love Keanu Reeves, um, and and the cast. The first film had a very strong beginning, middle, and end. Neo becomes the one. He sees the Matrix. He's able to fly and stop things and wave the walls, and it's done. He's yeah. he's it. And he squeaked two, three more films and an anime thing and, and all this other kind of stuff, and it just... Yeah. Uh, uh, and that's all I'll say about that. Um, but let me tell you, as I always say, if you love the Matrix in those films, keep on loving them because uh -huh. that's your thing. Exactly. Too few. Um, like Bob, I have two. Buckaroo Banzai. Hmm. Uh, you know, there was supposed to be a sequel and it just didn't do enough box office. Uh, it, it got into that cult status once it hit video as as many films uh in the 80s did um yeah and i want to say it, the the sequel came out either in a comic book or a book i i read there was, a, there was a book what, was it a book okay and it yeah, was a screenwriter and 
yeah, so it, it's on my radar to get that book at some point. Um, second film is RoboCop. It, it was a damn shame. Uh, <laughs> Frank Miller, you know, worked on the second film and the third film. And after the third film, he left Hollywood for like a decade because he's like, you know, writing a film in Hollywood. And, and this is not an exact quote, but writing a film in, in Hollywood is like being a fire hydrant in a dog park. Uh, you know, the director is the one who's going to tell the story and, and alter and change whatever. So you tell me what the hell happened with RoboCop 3. I don't know. Um, two, to me, was was pretty good. It wasn't that bad. Uh, would have been great to see Peter Weller again in the third film. And they should not have killed off. Um, can't think of uh, her character's name. Lewis. Hmm. And, and it was a senseless death. Uh, made no sense whatsoever, and they just moved on real quickly. Uh, would have been great to see more Robo films. I, I could have gone with another three with Peter. And, you know, Peter Wellen, especially in the first film, there was a cadence to the RoboCop. The guy who played him in the third film was like a wind-up robot. He would just walk around <laughs> like this. I'm like, what the hell are you doing? So, anyway, that, that's my answer. I'm sticking to it. I'm taking off my thinking cap. Okay. Well, I'll let you know if I think you guys need to... Good to think the caps back then. That was that was quite amusing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right, number seven, starting with Larry. Which movie has scared you the most? Mm. The third Matrix film. <laughs> Was played on a double feature with RoboCop Three. <laughs> no, the humanity. But you're gonna have to sit there all day. <laughs> uh, that that scared me, and I enjoyed it. Boy, um, it could be that it scared you and you enjoyed it, or it could be that it scared you so much you. Yeah. It doesn't really scare you now. Um, what scared me as a kid, but I really enjoy now, is the first Omen with Gregory Peck. Hmm. Um, it was. You know, being brought up with religious, super religious grandparents uh, and, and my mother, who was uh, also religious. Um, my father was not that religious, but the Greek Orthodox, you know, we'd go to weddings and we go to like special things. It's, it's a very uh, scary religion. I, I don't mean to uh, insult anyone, but it's just it's ancient. And, you know, there's ancient evils. Uh, you know, the devil and his demons and stuff like that. So the omen really freaked me out. And now I find it like fascinating, you know, how they came up with the story and the sign of the beast and and uh, all that. So first omen. All right. Over to you, Bob. Well, uh, I think I've told the story before, but <clears throat> when I was probably in uh, maybe eighth grade, seventh or eighth grade, a friend of mine from school called up and said, you've got to watch this movie on Creature Features. But you need to take a beanbag chair, put it in the middle of the living room, turn out all the lights, and watch the whole movie. Okay. So I did. And that movie was Night of the Living Dead. So, yeah, when you're, uh, you know, seventh or eighth grade and you're in a totally dark room with a beanbag chair where anything can sneak up behind you, then you're sitting there <laughs> watching Night of the Living Dead. That ah, was pretty damn spooky. Let me. I, uh, I, 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 honorable mention, my mother would, would tell us a tale of going to see The Tingler at the movies with uh, her younger brother, my uncle Gary. And that's when they had the hot plates or the buzzers but, in yeah. the seats. Yeah. Uh, William Castle film, King of the Gimmicks. And sure enough, you know, my uh, uncle Gary caught the buzzer and he was just freaked out the whole night um, from watching The Tingler. It's interesting to see, you know, what scared us then versus, you know, what they're putting out now you know oh, movies yeah. like the nun and you know oh, like, we were talking about frankenstein earlier i mean that that freaked out audiences completely back then mm -hmm. people have different tolerances and things um 
you know, and you, sometimes I really feel like when I watch some of these movies that were made in like 50s, 60s or 70s, like before things got really gory, they knew how to like really ratchet up tension, you know, and you don't see that maybe as much nowadays because they'll, well, they can make any kind of effect, you know, they can make a guy's head explode or whatever. You know, maybe they rely a little more on that than just good storytelling or tension. See, I'm uh, not too much into the gore, but yeah, <clears throat> give me a good creepy movie. Mm -hmm. A lot of suspense, a lot of letting your imagination run wild. That gets me a lot more than just seeing somebody's head explode or whatever. Oh, yeah. I think mm -hmm. films that elude to the violence or, you know, the, the monster, or the villain is going to break someone's neck and you don't see him breaking the neck, but you hear a crack, mm -hmm. you know, and someone saw it and said, uh, grab a bunch of celery and go. And then, yeah, yeah. You know, the other thing too is abominable Dr. Fives, just the weirdness of him. Well, Volnavia, we will now. And it's like, Oh my God, that's so weird, but, but so fascinating, you know, it's anyway, good, good questions. All right, let's see. Who went last? Bob went last. So oh. Bob, the, the last will be first and the first will be last. Um, our next question. I don't know. Maybe you'll need your thinking caps. I don't know. Uh, okay, Bob, if you could have any working, so like real working device or object from any movie or TV show, what would it be? Uh the Mach 5. Mm. I'd be driving around in the Mach 5 like I was speed racer. <laughs> good answer. Uh, that is a good answer. Um, if you look at my background, speed is like, right? He's right, right there. Oh, I see his little face. I am... You know, it it it's between becoming the bionic man, having the legs and the arm and the eye. Because <laughs> then it'd be like, oh, crap, you're late. And I'd be, -na 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 Yeah, but you'd be uh, running in slow motion, though. Uh, yeah, well. Uh, <laughs> uh, as I think about it, though, I think what would be more practical, if I could have any device or instrument, would be... Um, I'm going to say Doctor Who's TARDIS. Hmm. I could not only travel distances, I could travel back and forward in time. The TARDIS. Pretty powerful. Good answer. Okay. Really getting big inside. What's that? It's oh, really yeah. Big inside. Bob, we could fit all three of our collections <laughs> of the TARDIS. <laughs> all right, Larry. Yes. What, what is your favorite memory of a of a dining experience while you were at a convention? Mm. This is kind of a combo, both convention mm. and dining. So maybe when you went out to eat sometime, or or it could be eating at the convention. Something. It wouldn't be at the convention. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Oh, Price nachos and hot dogs are are not fun. I know uh, over the years we've we've done a lot of different. Yeah, see, it's hard to lock down just one because we have a, you know, we used to go to Monster Plus and we'd have a plus day and and we either go to a music park or a tiki bar, or, um, and and we'd have conversations like what we're <laughs> talking about here and, um, I'll tell you uh, what was the question again? What was the most memorable or or best? Your your favorite. Favorite. memory of a, a dining experience I, i'm going to tell you first one of my least favorite oh boy and uh, we laugh about it now me and some of my co-workers uh when the x-files movie came out the first movie they uh did a tour with uh all the stars except for jillian anderson and and um david duchovny so no stars <laughs> skinner <laughs> was there and actually mark snow the composer uh, of the of the music. I still have the CD. He he autographed it for me. I'm mm -hmm. um, in Krychek and or Krylichek and 
uh, cigarette smoke, all, all the guys, the, the three horsemen, all signed. I, I had a uh, copy of the TV guide that came out with all of them lined up. Well, the, the lone gunman. The lone gunman, sorry. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah. The three horsemen, the lone gunman, whatever. <laughs> um, and we were starving we we hadn't had breakfast because we wanted they were at these uh abandoned uh military bases and this one happened to be in vallejo mm -hmm. base out in vallejo and you know there, there's no restaurants nearby that location it was a ton of people we were it was just one big line and all they had vending were hot dogs and these hot dogs, I swear to God, were like $20 a hot dog or something. Ridiculous price. So we got a hot dog and we got like extra relish and mustard. We were sucking on the packs of relish and mustard to help alleviate the hunger. But uh, so that that's memorable, but that was one of the worst. Um, God dang it. Um, you know... Uh, you can go if you if you would rather go with memorable than favorite. No, I mean, yeah, it's um, you know, well, memorable. Uh, Monster Palooza, and we, you know, the only thing around there was Del Taco and Denny's, <laughs> and I think a Starbucks. So we went to Denny's frequently, and we'd always bump into like people. But um, the first night we went, I got the double cheeseburger, and it was one of the best double cheeseburgers I've ever had. Uh, great conversation with Walker. We actually met up with some of your monster board friends. Mm -hmm. and they gave us, like, uh, Dracula napkins and Frankenstein plates and stuff, <laughs> like, little, like, mementos. Um, but we went back a day or two later, and that I thought, well, let me try the double cheeseburger. It was still one of the best double cheeseburgers. I had uh, so it was fun it was memorable and uh, that, that's my answer Bob over to you well I'd say there were three all having to do with shows we put on <clears throat> one would be Richard Keel we had dinner with him Bob and I took him up to the, the restaurant at the top of the uh, Hilton I believe Either the Hilton or Hyatt, anyway, in San Francisco. And, of course, we're thinking, man, we're going to go broke feeding this guy. <laughs> we get up there, and, of course, he, he was on a scooter at that point. Mm -hmm. And we come in, and this one waiter comes up, and he looks. He goes, James Bond. Because yeah. he, he played Jaws in the two Bond movies. And so they took us to a nice window seat table, and he and his wife, Split a salad. That's hmm. all they ate. But he had a ton of great stories because not only was he Jaws and James Bond and the uh, Moonraker and uh, Spy Who Loved Me, but he was also on uh, in Silver Streak and Happy Gilmore, Twilight Zone, on the Monkeys. That he was just tell us all these. He used to tell us stories all night, and that was great. Another one would be Judith O'Day, star Barbara from Night of Living Dead. And uh, we took her out to dinner, Bob and I did. And yeah, she was just, she just has these amazing stories because she was like skin diving and doing all this other stuff. You know, she was like, you know, like 70 or something. And uh, yeah, and she's a really nice person. And then probably the dinner I had with one of the nicest celebrities I have ever met in my life. Total sweetheart. Kevin and I took Marta Kristen out to dinner. And uh, yeah, she, you know, she had some good stories and things, but just one of the nicest people you'd ever want to meet. So that was uh, memorable as well. Favorite of the three? Uh, I would probably have to say I'd go with Marta, I think. Hmm. All right. Nice. Some good stories there. Okay. We're starting to move into the home stretch. So 
Lento, 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 lento. <laughs> if you could sit and talk to any genre related creative person, so it could be an actor, it could be a writer, producer, director, makeup person, any anybody, uh, you know, in, in that sort of creative space. So if you could talk to any of them, uh, living or dead, okay, who that's would my be, next question. <laughs> <laughs> who, who would it be and, and why? So we'll start with Bob. Oh, um, you know, top of my head, I would say George Romero. Hmm. But thinking a little bit, and he just passed away. I see either Roger Corman or Sam Arkoff hmm. or even William Castle. Any of those guys that made a lot out of a little. And if you read their autobiographies, they all have certain things in common, like they started with nothing or they mortgaged a house or they did whatever just to just to get their foot into what they wanted to do. And uh, I just admire them for that. And of course, all the, the films and things that they made. But yeah, George Romero, though, uh, just king of the zombies. So, you know, just to sit there and talk to him about not just the making of his films, but his philosophies behind, behind the ghouls or zombies or what have you. Uh, I know he used to talk about the fast zombies versus the slow zombies. And he's like, these guys are dead. They're rotting. If they started running, their bones would just snap and they'd fall to the ground. It's like, <laughs> yeah, they can't run. Right. What are you talking about? So if I have to pick one person, I'll say George Romero. Okay. That Where? was a good process of elimination there, Bob. Um, um, so you're doing the calculations again. I am. Um, <laughs> okay, so it's Vincent Price, George Lucas, Gene Roddenberry, or Rod Serling. Wow, that's a list. That's a list. Um, I am going to go with um, Gene Roddenberry. And, you know, I just have conversations about his... Uh, early career uh exactly how he got into star trek and what was what has been written by others versus his story hmm. that, that could be quite a, a conversation but of all those choices larry was picked the only one that's still alive with george lucas I said George Lucas, but I meant Gene Roddenberry. I'm so sorry. You said, you said Gene Roddenberry. I yeah. did. Oh, okay. George Lucas was on your list, though. George Lucas was on my list. So George is the only one who's still alive. You know, alive. yeah. So he uh, would probably be the most interesting conversation. He's alive? Is the rest of dead? They just sit there at the table. like. I, no, I'd, I'd go on the TARDIS and go backwards in time while they're still alive and... I yes, cheat. we're pre presuming that you could speak to the, them as they are living, not, you know, speaking to their corpses. So that wouldn't be very entertaining. <laughs> All right, gentlemen. Yes. Mr. Mr. Larry, mm. what remake is better than the original? That's a tough one. Ooh. Not that there are a lot of things to choose from, but <laughs> the thinking cap goes back. The thinking fez goes back on. And uh, yes, he's got a drink out of his, <laughs> his uh, tiki mug. Uh... Now it could be a remake or a reimagining, however you want to look at it. But essentially, yes, it's a, a redo of an older film. Better than the original. Um... Than the original. Bob, if you've got something, I'm drawing a blank. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, don't take my choice. Don't take my yeah. <laughs> um, Well, okay. No, you know what? <clears throat> I will say Godzilla minus one. Um, I love the original Godzilla, but minus one 
is superb. It's on Netflix right now. If you guys haven't seen it, watch it. I've, I've seen it multiple times. I kick myself for not getting to see it in IMAX. Um, it's as good, if not a little bit better than the original, uh, in my humble opinion. Yeah, right. I saw it in IMAX. It was pretty the cool. Lucky SOB. Uh, oh, I tried to see it in however many different forms I could. Yeah. Um, I was actually thinking John Carper is the thing. Mm, that's a good one. Real good. As much as I love Thing from Another World, mm -hmm. 50s, I think I love the 82 thing more. I would probably agree with you. Well, we did a whole episode on all the things. Yeah. We did. Do That's also a, things. It's also a close second between the original Invasion of the Body Snatchers and the 1978 remake. That, that's a good one, too. I was thinking about that as well. And then you have, like, The Fly and The Fly. The Fly and Fly. See, I really love the original Fly, because that was my very first genre film I ever saw. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm sitting here. That's what got me into all this stuff. <laughs> He's going to stick with the original Fly. On the fly, David Hedison and Vincent Price, classic. You can't improve um, on it with that I'll Jeff say, Goldblum. That, that, you got that right, Bubala. <laughs> um, I'll I'll throw in the mix, and I love Vincent Price in in um, Last Man on Earth and the Morgan, Morgan, but um. Charlton Heston in uh, Omega Man. Omega Man. Yeah, it's just. Damn you all to hell! Oh wait, that's <laughs> the wrong. <laughs> but that's okay. Yeah, I mean, I like both. I kind of, I mean, I love, love, love Last Man on Earth. So I don't. I would probably give a nod that way, but um, no offense to Chuck, but uh, Chuck takes none. But, <laughs> Chuck, Chuck, Chuck. The original film is just so moody and mysterious and uh, one of my favorites. So, I love, I love that soundtrack. Yeah. I love that day we drove around L.A. listening to the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We were in the rental. Mega Man. Yeah. Yeah. That oh, very good. Okay. We're almost there. Now, let's see. We're going to Bob. Okay, Bob. I feel like I need some music, like oh, oh, <laughs> because I'm going to ask you. Yes. What is the Grail item on your list? That one special item that you have not been able to get, or or you're still looking for the one thing that you want to collect that you haven't added to your collection yet. Julie Newmar. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Oh, we're not going too crazy and saying the Mach 5 or the Batmobile. Like the life-size version? Yeah, or the life-size version of the Boston Space Robot. <laughs> um, I would say a life-size, you know, Larry and I almost had one. Oh, my God. Almost, but not quite. That debacle. It would have to be the life-size creature from the Black Lagoon. Oh, has the picture the one that looks better than the picture that Larry's. <laughs> oh, yeah, that story. Didn't we almost? It, it, did is that? What did that happen right as we were starting the podcast? Oh, it was one know. of our first video episodes. It was one of the first video episodes. Yeah. Oh my lord. Yeah, go back I, and look for that one if you want. That That's paper mache oh, creature or whatever it was. That just um, showed up on my Facebook memories. So you know, it was like, yeah, okay, on so this time. You you still need to get a like high quality life size creature. Yeah, yeah. Like, are they out there? Like, are they? Oh, they're out there. Oh yeah, they're like six, seven grand or something. Oh yeah. Uh, Jeff was talking to me. Uh, these people have these huge industrial three D printers, 
and uh, he he has some he has a couple of two or three three printers. He made a uh, Decker's gun from um, Blade Runner. Blade Runner. Huh. Yeah, but anyway, he uh, he um, did a commission for this guy, and he he three uh, D printed a Dalek, a life size Dalek for Jeff and Jeff's going to put that together. And I'm like, Oh my God. I don't even want to ask how much that uh, cost. Wow. Jeff also, he got it from Sideshow, a life-size um, Terminator that you plug in and the lights light up and. Holy cow. Yeah. That stuff's out there. Uh, um, of course it is. Why didn't you even ask? Of course it is. If, if you could think of it, it's going to be out there. No, I mean, if anyone listening has a life-size creature, <laughs> a really cool creature corner that it would look really good in, <laughs> hit me up. Um, my Holy Grail. Um, Sideshow Collectibles back in like the 90s, maybe early 2000s, came out with a Doctor Doom premium format figure sitting on his throne oh yes and that thing you know at the time it was like 200 250 bucks and i'm like i'm not gonna spend you know 250 dollars on a and it goes for like thousands now if you can find it and i'm just hey, sideshow a lot of the mondo stuff it's like even if it's too expensive grab it when it comes yeah. out you'll never grab it again yeah yeah um so those of you on on YouTube again, this is this is my best Doctor Doom figure that I have, <laughs> which is it's pretty decent. Uh, nice, it's a twelve inch action figure, right? Yeah, looks like uh, it could go up against GI Joe. No, hey, that's you a good idea. I'm, I'm going to put him up over by the GI Joes and right. RoboCop. Ah. Doom does not engage in fisticuffs. <laughs> there is a, a good fight, though. Doctor Doom and RoboCop. Doom. Well, Doom would just sick his robots on RoboCop. Yeah, Doom would use black magic and and sorcery and technology and poor Robo, especially like in RoboCop three. That spoiler alert: the the ninja uh, robot would knock him on his butt, and RoboCop can't sit up on his own or you know he's because you know um i saw that film once i i had seen it once as well and they geared it more towards kids and yeah. you know there's this whole anyway doom would definitely um destroy unfortunately robo i i love robocop but you yeah all right gentlemen you've reached the end when, There's when, one more when, one more question. Okay. But I think everyone. It's a big one. Last question. We'll understand. Caps. So Larry, we'll start with you, right? Because I think you had the end here. Describe, and this is a non-genre. This is just life. Describe the rest of your life in five words. You know, it's interesting because uh, it, it hit me the other day. I was, you know, because Karen and I and Bob talk about retirement. We're getting to that point in our lives where it's closer than than it's ever been before. So five words, because I, I thought of what the rest of my life would be once I retire. Um And it doesn't, it doesn't have to be, it could be a sentence. It could just be five words. It can be whatever combination you want. You know, I can do it in two words. The rest of my life would be Larry Con. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'll expand upon that in that I'd wake up with cosplay every morning. I'd watch interviews on YouTube. I'd watch uh, genre movies. I would, uh, just live in a convention. Larry Con. Larry Con. All right, sir. Very good. Pop. Cinco. Doing what I want. Always. <laughs> I was going to say all the time, but then that's like three more words. But any time would have been, but always works. Always works. All right, and now with that, our Planet 8 
audience should have insight into the very depths of your souls. So I hope this has been amusing and enlightening for everyone. Very well done, my friend. This was oh. fun. <laughs> um, did we surprise you at all with our answers? Uh, yes, a little bit. Uh, although I think I've known you both now for a while. So some of the things were kind of a gimme, the universal monster and so forth. But but yes. Uh, I, we, surpri I surprised her with Star Wars. Yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> that was a good one. But we don't, I don't think we'll, we'll hear anything about that. But if you said that, like in, you know, on the interwebs, you might get some angry folks, but who cares, right? It's your this week at LarryCon, <laughs> dress up as C-3PO and watch all 10 Star Wars films. Why do I say 10? Because Rogue One needs to be smack dab between three and four. And then next week on Larry Kong. Okay. I tell you. The one question I wish I had, had left in, it, originally I was going to ask you what was the best pizza. But mm. I took that one out in, in favor of the dining experience, which I think. I, I, I can, <laughs> I can, that, that's a bonus. I can, I can tell you right now, we got a pizza parlor here called Porky's Pizza. Porky's and I, I am a pizza connoisseur. Deep dish, New York, uh, hell, even a good round table pizza. And, and and actually, yeah, go ahead, Bob. Uh, you got a favorite pizza? I know pizza's not really in your milieu. Well, no, I mean, being diabetic, pizzas like shoot my blood sugar up to the oh. wall. Oh, so. well, there's a good reason that I guess I don't have pizza on it. Though Debbie does make pizzas on like a portobello mushroom. I've, mm -hmm. I've actually mm -hmm. had some with cauliflower crust. I tried yes, that. Yes, I saw you that know. the other day. Yes. We do what we must, Bob. We do what we must. <laughs> no, I mean, I tried one with cauliflower crust and still shot it up to the roof. So is, you got to. Oh, really? That sucks. Yeah. It's Campbell. He needs attention. Oh, <laughs> that's a cute little doggy. Now I don't think he likes being held. But say hello to everybody. Okay. <laughs> well, damn it. Well, this was fun. We'll we'll need to we'll need to do a Bob and Larry ask Karen fifteen questions at some. Oh my God, I feel singled out. Turn the tables on the reconnaissance officer. Yes. Or you know we could always do like Bob asks me and you fifteen questions, and I get to ask you and Bob <laughs> questions. Well, it depends on how well this episode goes over. <laughs> Like that's ever stopped us before. If it tanks in the ratings, then. <laughs> well, do we have a censor sweep? This is the point in our episode where we talk about our censor sweep. Um, who wants to go first? Well, I don't usually go first, so I could go first. Sounds uh, good. Oh, a couple of weeks ago, Shout Factory, which is those guys they are so good um they were having they a, a hammer sale get you could get hammered no um so a hammer films <laughs> for sale and there's actually there's a few hammer films they don't have and so i picked up a couple i picked up the abominable snowman mm, one of my favorites you Him know it's one of those films i've seen but not seen very many times so i wanted to grab that one and then Curse of the Werewolf. Ooh, another uh, good is, one. Yeah, another one that um, I know I've I've seen it a few times, but it's again not one that's shown a lot, and I didn't have in my any of my collection. So yeah, I have that I Curse of the Werewolf it. bust. Mm. In my living room. So that yeah, followed me home from the San Jose Toy Show once. So that's my latest acquisitions. Well, I'll go next and, and Bob can bring up the rear if that's okay with you, Chief. Uh, from our friends at Monk Tiki Monkenstein, it was recently Father's Day 
So this is the Bigfoot Stein for those of you on YouTube. There's Bigfoot with his son, baby Bigfoot. And they're going fishing and but little foot. Uh, little foot. These bad boys are numbered. This is mug number 280. And uh, originally came out in 2015. They are now half off, or they were. I don't know, after Father's Day, sure. they may have sold out. But if you go to Munkenstein.com, you might be lucky enough to pick up one of these bad mamma jammers. Hot damn. What you got for us? I'll just take one thing and see what we got. Um, if you remember way back to our King Kong episode, mm. we discussed Dino De Laurentiis's King Kong. And we talked about his big robot Kong that was supposed to be in like most of the movie, but it wouldn't move very well. And it just sat there leaking oil everywhere. And uh, it's basically in one scene where he's in that, that form fitting cage and he kind of rips his way out. So you just see it there like raising its arms. So for whatever reason, eight years later, Toho was making Godzilla 1984, and uh, they decided to make a what they called a Cybot Godzilla. Same type of thing, full you know, full size mechanical Godzilla that was supposed to be in most of the film and didn't work very well. So it's mainly in kind of bust shots where Godzilla is kind of curling his lips or you know, roar, putting his head back and roaring. And there's one scene with the hobo in the uh, bar where he sees Godzilla and starts running and Godzilla's behind him and that's the Cybot. So for whatever reason, X Plus decided to make a figure of the Cybot Godzilla. So if you're looking on YouTube, there he is. Mm -hmm. You can see he looks nothing like the actual Godzilla 1984 suit. Okay, I that was what I was going to ask as an un, uninformed person. Yes. How can you tell that he's not just like Godzilla, Godzilla? Well, if you look at his head, it's rather rounded out. And if you look at his midsection, he's almost like uh, the new legendary Godzilla from Godzilla versus uh, Godzilla X Kong. Because his waist is very thin. It looks like he has a girdle on in his waist there. <laughs> if you watch Godzilla 1984 or 1985, whichever one you find, um, you'll tell. You'll be able to tell in the movie the differences between the suit and the uh, and the cybot. I, I was going to say, Walker, you'd have to watch the film to really... It, it's not on for very long, but you're like, whoa, it's very noticeable. Okay. So that was my offering for the sensor sweep. Very nice. Uh, let me say, um, I'm, I, I watched um, on Amazon, uh, RoboDoc, the creation of RoboCop. Um, originally, there was a GoFundMe or a Kickstarter. And oh, they had a few great. Yeah. Um, and it is great. If you're a fan of RoboCop, they actually have uh, Verhoeven and Peter Weller um, in the documentary, and, and they they discuss a lot of uh, behind the scenes um, anecdotes, and you know, there's funny stories about you know Peter Weller wanted to immerse himself into the RoboCop character, and so he insisted that people call him Robo on the set, and some of these some of these grips and electricians are like, well, I'm not gonna call him RoboCop. And uh, anyway, there's a lot of like fun stories, interesting stories on um, how they made the movie. Um, so if you get a chance, I recommend you check it out. That's on Amazon Prime now? Amazon Prime, yeah. I have to check that out because I, I listened to a podcast last year where they interviewed the, <clears throat> sorry, I'm losing my voice. They okay. interviewed the people who um, were making that documentary. Oh. And They've done a couple of documentaries, these guys, and, okay. and they're really good. I mean, they, there was, well, might not be the same guys, but there, there's like a circle of people doing these documentaries. 
And it, this is great. This is up there with, you know, all the other ones. Yeah, it sounded really interesting. And they had to work really hard to get Peter Weller to be in the, the documentary. And and he is very candid. Uh, you know, there's this, one of the groups was like, well, yeah, you know, Peter, you know, he couldn't really eat and, you know, get hungry. And, and I was eating some Oreo cookies. And Peter was like, Robo wants an Oreo. <laughs> like, sorry, Peter. He, he, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to call you Robo. If you say Peter wants an Oreo, I'll give you an Oreo. Robo wants an Oreo. No, not going <laughs> to. So then he says, Robo wants an Oreo, according to the group. And so one of the production guys is on the radio. Can you give Robo a, a, a Oreo, please? <laughs> I understand you have Oreos. And the guy says, I took the three Oreos that I had left and I crammed them in my mouth. I don't have any more Oreos. <laughs> Peter was like, ah, all right, all right. So someone had to go to the store, get him an Oreo. There's another story, a spoiler alert, where um, That's good. they're like, yeah, Peter, he, he'd bring like all these chicks and he's like, you know, having sex with them in his when a bagel and all our bagels are together and they they cut to him and he's like hey man it was the 80s and you know it was the star of a film and yeah you know we messed around it reminded me of arnold schwarzenegger right you now well you know he went and got like a phd in fine arts or something like that and really yeah <laughs> he's uh he wears like an ascot he kind of reminds me of like you know old school he's Hollywood. a weird chap yeah he is. He did, you know, what was it? Naked Lunch. Uh, instead of that was he did that instead of RoboCop three. So, it's a fascinating and fun documentary. <laughs> so I recommend uh, you guys check it out. Um, let me ask you guys, Bob. I know for sure you're watching because you know Debbie is your wife. What do you think of the Acolyte? What are we three three episodes in? Fourth episode drops soon. Three. Yeah, to, yeah fourth of the night. So, uh, you know, it's all right. I, you know, I think it's so far more engaging than some of the ones I didn't like, like Endor or Boba Endor. Fett. But uh, I don't know. I have to kind of see where it goes. It kind of got all bogged down when they started going to the backstory of the two sisters. Yeah, I'll I'll tell you if you're not familiar with the. Uh the story of the witches and their ability to use the force and you know a lot of the stuff from the animated shows most certainly the clone wars and um i think a little bit in uh rebels uh you might be a little kind of like what these aren't the same it's not the same witches though right it's, it, a it's not it's yeah no no it, it's not the same witches but it's that idea a lot of people online are talking about well how can you know, anybody can be a force wielder then. And, you know, it's like, well, and then they can create life for, you know, so Darth Plagueis was, like, well, who's to say, you know, they didn't teach Darth Plagueis how to, you know, I don't know. I I, I, I think for me, I just, I, I think the biggest sin is that I just have not found any of it interesting. I, I mean, I, you know, they can do all these different things, and you know oh it's breaking canon or whatever you know okay that's fine we you know a lot of things have broken canon but it's like ultimately i don't find any um i don't find the characters appealing or interesting and the, and the story hasn't drawn me in so that's i just sit there waiting for something that's going to make me care and i i don't so that's my problem with it right now it, it's hard to do a Star Wars movie. Uh, you know, they said before without Jedi, the complaint with Andor. And, you know, now you got like a bunch of Jedi. And it's 100 years before episode one. But we're not supposed to see any legacy characters. And after the debacle of Strange New Worlds, um, <laughs> I'm glad that there's not going to be any legacy characters. And they they were kind of a, some of the things I'm reading. They were aware of that. And they didn't, you know, they could have brought on, brought on Yoda, but they decided not to. They could have brought on Chewbacca, but they said they didn't. I don't know if they might, you know, yeah, try and surprise it. us. Yeah, never know. It yeah, and it's hard to like, you know, care about this character. They're a Jedi, or they want to be a Jedi, or they're twins. 
without giving them a backstory. And that's always the, the two or three episodes. I have the rule of three. New Star Trek series comes out, give me three episodes. New whatever. Three episodes, if you can't convince me in the third after the third episode, I might not be watching it. Um, look, and I always go back to Deep Space Nine. First season of Deep Space Nine, first season of The Next Generation. A lot of stinkers in those, you know, yeah. and so... I don't know. Uh, it, it's not must see TV for me. Um, I'm not. I doubt there'll be any man tears. I'm not <laughs> emotionally attached to these characters. Um, it just goes to show you, though, what fine detail and um, understanding of the Star Wars universe that uh, the folks working in the Mandalorian. Uh, series gave us yeah i look at the mandalorian like it is for me anyway it's the best it's so good it's probably better than anything after empire hmm. and it's like okay if you can do that then why can't you do another series that's halfway decent yeah you so say the first two seasons of mandalorian were just about perfect, you know, and they didn't have to, you know, I mean, they had some, a little Jedi action, but most of it wasn't focused on Jedi or anybody we knew, you know, it was mostly new characters. And so it, it, it you know, it shows that they could do something different with Star Wars and be successful. Yes. But when they showed Ahsoka talking to Luke, and admittedly, I've watched every episode of The Clone Wars, so I'm deeply embedded in Ahsoka's story and her mm -hmm. her journey. And it, you know, this is going to be Larry Con. We'll do a Star Wars probably for a year to watch all the cartoons and everything. Um, Anakin's apprentice talking to Anakin's son and filling in the gaps. You know, if if I knew my father's like best friend in high school or grade school or whatever and i'd ask well you know I, it just it's fascinating to me that that we we got just a piece of that yeah um yeah so it's funny you know what do you guys think of the acolyte let's talk about mandalorian because that was her <laughs> <thing> made <laughs> a lot of people what do you guys think about the argument between star wars and uh, george lucas star wars and disney star wars is there is there a, a definitive difference in the way that they're telling the story, setting up the characters? Is there too much, too little? The direction is mucked up. Differences, but I mean, let's face it: the the, see, the prequel trilogy wasn't like cinematic gold. I, I was just going to say, people hated the prequels for years too. I think they've the, aged very well. And that's the thing. Now people, because there's a whole generation that grew up with the prequels and that's what they love, right? So the prequels have been kind of, you know, washed over and everybody, yeah, they're not prequels are good. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't stand Jar Jar, but like I said, Kayla and her friends, that's their Star Wars. Exactly. I mean, she grew up on Luke and 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 Han and and you know Leia. Um but that's her, you know, Obi-Wan story. And she loved the Obi-Wan series because, and I, I liked it too. I thought Obi-Wan is a great series. It told this good story. And uh, anyway, we're probably going over our, our allotted time for the <laughs> podcast. I don't, um, we should probably do a Star Wars universe, everything. We could talk about Darth Jar Jar, but that's for another episode. All right, my friends, any last minute uh, things you want to talk about, share? Um, any more questions, Walker? Oh, well, there's always more, but we'll save them. <laughs> well, this was fun. Um, those of you out there listening, thank you very much. Those of you out there watching, thank you very much. Please subscribe to the podcast. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you have any questions that you would like to ask myself or Bob, please type in the comments. You can also, you know what? You can ask Karen some questions too before Bob and I. 
get to, and we'll do our best to answer them for you. Appreciate you guys. Stay safe. Take care. Um, this is Planet A signing off. Peace out. On that note, this will conclude this transmission from Planet 8. We would like to thank all of our intergalactic audience for listening. Be sure to head on over to our website at www.planet8podcast.com where you can get more information on this episode's topic. For more conversation, find us on Twitter at Planet8Cast. Or on Facebook at facebook.com slash planet8podcast. We want to thank you guys for tuning in each and every episode. We look forward to your input and opinions. Until next time, this is Planet 8 signing off. End transmission. By George, he's got it. It is the end.